Cool. Uh, let me get started on randomness oracles. So, um, yeah, why uh, might you want randomness on chain? Uh, there are a couple uses uh, and probably more we haven't even thought of. Uh, first is NFT minting. So if you have a bunch of traits that you want to distribute amongst uh, anyone minting and you want that to be perceived as fair. You don't want it such that all the insiders are getting the good NFTs and all of the community members are getting the bad ones. Uh, you basically want everything to be distributed randomly, um, as random as possible, such that it is perceived to be fair. Um, same thing with loot drops in a video game. Uh, you don't want some insider getting uh, all the cool skins and the cool weapons. Uh, you want this to be uh, random. Uh, lotteries, gambling, these are sort of obvious applications where um, if there's a lot of money on the line in a poker game, then, uh, well, any sort of chance to tamper that uh, will not go well. People will probably not play poker uh, with you if you have a way to tilt the odds. Um, the last thing, I don't know if we've seen this too much these days, but I think in the future this will be a big thing. On-chain, sort of like selecting jurors uh, and generally just like sortition and governance. Uh, this is how, uh, you know, sort of political office was chosen in like democratic Athens. You would basically just decide on who the candidates were, and then you would randomly choose which ones were actually, um, you know, appointed, uh, which is actually a pretty good way to get, um, you know, fair uh, representation in a governance system. And obviously, we still use this today in a more limited uh, sense for like juries um, in common law. So, yeah. Um, so we've already established that we want to get randomness on chain. Uh, how can we do this? I think the first naive implementation that you might think of is to use the block hash. And I think some of the early Ethereum apps did do this. Um, there are a couple of problems with this though. Uh, one, you can only get a past block hash. You can't get the current block hash of the current block because when your transaction's executing, uh, you, um, well, the block hash hasn't been computed yet. So it's sort of impossible. Um, so you can only get a past block hash. And um, you know the issue with this is that it's sort of known everybody already knows uh, what it is. And so you can just compute what it is. And then as, if you have a way to uh, insert your transaction in such a way um, to get um, whatever, basically you can manipulate um, the outcomes um, if you know what inputs are gonna produce what outputs because it's not random anymore. Everybody knows a predetermined value. You might wanna paper over this solution by saying, well, we'll put in a request for randomness uh, today and then we'll wait five blocks, uh, and then we'll use that block hash. The issue with this is that now uh, you're basically allowing the, um, the block builder, or now the sequencer on an L2 or an L3, um, to, they basically have privileged access to determine what the block hash is. Uh, so if you're using like the last bit of the block hash to determine what, uh, you know, whether a coin comes up heads or tails, well, basically you just rearrange the transactions until the bit you want is heads or tails, and then that's the block, you commit that, and then uh, you can now manipulate the outcome. So this might've been done back in the day. Basically, no one uses the block hash anymore for randomness. It is not a good idea. Uh, the next thing you might wanna do is use the signature of a private key. Um, so provided that the message that um, you are, uh, that, that someone is signing is unique and provided that no one else knows that private key, then this is actually quite a good way to get randomness. Um, basically, uh, the, the first assumption that the input is unique is actually quite easy to get. You basically say like, you're gonna make the request to this contract, which is a unique ID on this chain, another unique ID, and then you're gonna have some sort of unique counter for request IDs. So you can get it actually pretty good. Um, it'll be pretty easy to get like a unique message uh, for this private key to sign. Uh, the issue is that uh, if you have a single private key, you've now basically put all your trust in one uh, person to basically not share that private key around to a bunch of different people. Um, and also that they are, they're, they're no longer allowed to participate in the loot drop in the NFT minting because they're the source of randomness. They're the one that can basically manipulate uh, this whole process, right? If I'm the holder of the, the of the signer and I'm also minting NFTs, well then I can know in advance that all the good traits will be you know, on ID number five or whatever. And then as long as I get ID number five, then uh, this is no longer that secure. So the, the way that you can solve this is basically, uh, there are methods to distribute this private key 
amongst a bunch of different actors such that uh, everyone holds a shard of it and it comes together to create one uh, you know, public private key pair. And as long as one, there's like a one of n honest assumptions such that as long as one person is not colluding with all the rest, then um, this is secure. No one actually knows the, the full private key. And uh, you can basically submit a proof um, that this is uh, you know, verifiably random. Um, the, yeah, the, the other part that I missed about this is that the signature basically gives you a proof, right? Because you can verify the message and the address um, and the message, or sorry, and the signature all you know, fit together. Um, and so you can do the same thing with like a sharded private key in principle. And so when we're talking about like uh, verifiable random functions, this is more or less what's happening under the hood is basically, um, you know, a sharded private key that's coming together to sign a message. And then that is the proof is basically just a signature. Um, now there are some other, uh, sources of randomness that are also quite secure that are good as well. So one is DRAND. Um, basically this is a basically just a blockchain, uh, not exactly a blockchain cause there's no, um, you know, um, like coins or like sort of state. It's basically just a bunch of nodes that are coming together to produce randomness, uh, all the time. So we can just see it tick by here. Basically what is the round? Um, so basically they've been doing this for, you know, uh, 12 million rounds, um, or more. And basically every second, every two seconds, three seconds, I forget exactly what the epoch count is. They're just going to keep producing hashes. And it also has this sort of like one of them honest assumption such that, um, you know, as long as one member is not colluding with all the rest, then, uh, this is secure. No one will, no one will know what the output of this, um, hash is, um, at the next round ID. So. If you have an Oracle to just bring these values on chain, that can be a good source of randomness. And then lastly, uh, basically a uh, key management service, which I'm sure a lot of you have seen this. It's basically just a wall of lava lamps that uh, Cloudflare and some other people use to generate randomness. Basically, you can just take a picture of these lava lamps every second or so and uh, take the hash of that and that is securely random. And unless someone discovers some physics equation to exactly predict the movements of a hundred plus different lava lamps, plus the lighting and all the other different things that can affect uh, the exact bits of this image, then this is basically random. What we're doing is basically just taking, um, you know, some uh, source of randomness from the real world and digitizing it. Because as you know, it's very difficult to get a computer to produce random numbers, truly random numbers. So these are basically our options. Um, for conduit VRF, which is what we've deployed on the Athena testnet that you guys can use now, is basically the latter two options. Uh, we basically have a wall of lava lamps and we have DRAND um, that you guys can request random numbers from. Um, basically, you make the request, a keeper bot will fill that request and it'll come back fairly quickly. So on OP stack rollups, which is Athena is OP stack, it'll come back in about two seconds. So the next block. And on Arbitrum, block times are 250 milliseconds, so it should come back in the next block. So it feels like very real time, it's snappy. And then if you already have um, a contract that is written to plug into like Chainlink or Gelato VRF, which are other you know random oracles, then uh, it, there are some adapters that make it quite easy. Um, and then this is the fee equation. It's not that interesting. I think I'll just start going through some code to show you guys what you might be able to build here. Um, so this is a die roller contract that I've deployed, um, on the Athena testnet right now. It is basically the simplest possible, um, random application you could build. Um, so I'm going to start at the top here. Basically we inherit from this contract called conduit VRF consumer base, which, uh, basically just makes it so that, uh, it sets up some guardrails so you don't make mistakes when interacting with the VRF Oracle. Um, so. You plug in the address of the, of the Oracle, uh, which is up here. Um, and then when we want to roll the die, you just call VRF.request. You send some money to pay for the request. If you want to calculate exactly how to do the fees, um, that's in the docs. It's this equation right here. Um, and then we're going to pass in three parameters. This is calculate round. This is a convenience function, part of Conduit VRF consumer base. And it basically calculates um, the based on the current timestamp, the next um, secure DRAND epoch. Um, so at, by the time that this executes, that value will be unknown. And by the time that 
fulfill the callback the fulfill randomness function um, is filled by the keeper, then uh, it will be known and you'll get um, secure randomness. The next parameter is just like the gas. So basically when the randomness is delivered, you can perform like arbitrarily complex logic uh, in the callback. And so basically what you're paying for over here in the message value is basically like how much gas, like how complex is that callback, is that transaction? Um, and then lastly, you can just tag this with arbitrary bytes. So if you wanna, you know, who who is rolling the die at what time they do it, what other, whatever other data you wanna fill out, you can also pass in here. And then some magic happens that uh, we'll get into in a bit happens. And then it uh, calls this function fulfill randomness with the actual random value, um, the ID of the randomness, which is what's returned up here when we roll the die. And then these bytes, which in this case we just throw away, but you could use to like, you know, get uh, like a richer, um, whatever, just more data attached to this request that you might not know otherwise. Um, you just do some checks, make sure that it's actually the VRF contract that's calling this, make sure that um, it wasn't already filled, and then just take this randomness value, modulo six, add one, and that is um, the randomness value. Um, I'll just do a quick demo just to show what this is like. Let me see if I can share. Let's do this terminal. Cool. So basically, I just have a cast transaction to do this already. So this is the die roller contract. We're going to call roll die with this unit 56. Here's the Athena RPC URL, the private key. Um, and then just some value here um, to pay for the request. And when we send that, we'll wait for it to come through. Cool. And let's go back to the Explorer. Oh. I'm not sure if what we're seeing we the right thing. We can see... Um a terminal, but possibly not the correct one. Uh, oh, you guys can't see this. Oh, shoot, shoot, shoot. All right. Well, um, OK. Let me fix that. <laughs> Is that right? All right, well, the transaction was already executed, but basically it's not that interesting. Basically just send a request to the die roller contract, roll the die, send a little bit of value to pay for the request, and then we can check on chain that this was actually executed correctly. Um, copy the transaction hash. Mm -hmm. Cool. Let's go to the testnet here. Cool. So if we go to the logs, basically what request ID did we get? Request ID four. And so if we go to the die roller contract and we ask for what die roll was number four, we got a six. So that's about the simplest application that you can build um, with BRF. Uh, and then just going to take some time to go through actually some of the callback logic here, what is actually going on. Um, so, you know, over here, we basically made a request. We just called vrf.request over here. And then in the actual coordinator contract, we are just doing some checks. Uh, if you oversend, then we'll send, we'll refund you. Like if you pay, overpaid, um, just I'm making some logs, basically information so that the keeper can keep up with the stuff. Um, and then the keeper bot will basically call back in using this Oracle callback function. Um, and the callback that's stored, they're just going to call it with the exact gas that you paid for. Um, and then with this exact, you know, fulfill randomness, what value, uh, what ID and what extra data did you want? And, uh, yeah, that's about it. That is how VRF works here. Um, I think now is a good time to take questions. Uh, I'm going to start in the questions tab, which there are none. 
it looks like. Yeah, I think these are all left over from the first part of the workshop. Does anyone have any questions for Drew now? What is prevent? What about block dot prev randau? Uh, I'm not even aware of this. Um, uh, this is probably a biased post. Um, Okay, I can't answer that question, but uh, yeah, there's some results on Google. Let's say it's bad. Um, in general, it's it's really hard for blockchains to be random, just because like the all the inputs for like what creates a block are like known. Um, yeah, I mean, so it it really depends on like the crucialness, like how secure do you need your application to be? Like sometimes if you just need something quick and dirty, and you're really not securing any value, then like why not just use the block hash? Um, but like. Anytime like a something of value comes into question, so like you're minting NFTs or you want to um, whatever loot boxes, governance, like you want something more secure. Um, like I think, yeah, when it's not crucial, like you could totally use block hash pre rando. Um, yeah. So we shared um, this guide um, in the email before the session, and it's also in the resources uh in the hacker pack drew could you sort of talk through the i it is pretty self-explanatory but just like yeah. if you show the guide and sort of talk through it yeah these are the docs um eventually this will be published on like docs.conduit but for now this is fine so basically um yeah the uh, this is where the um like the vrf is deployed the adapter factory so this is like if you have um a contract that's already written for Chainlink, you can use this to basically, um, you know, conveniently migrate um, without changing any of your code. Um, and there, there's some docs down here for how to do that exactly. Um, basically, introduction of like what our sources of randomness are, um, integrating BRF. Yeah, basically a guide on how to write this. It kind of walks you through um, the die roller contract that I just did. Um, more information on pricing. So this will be more crucial um, when you actually get to like writing maybe like a front end because you want to actually like get an accurate gas estimation. You don't want your users to be like, you know, uh, please send us like one ETH for this request. And like it will get refunded back to them, but like it's sort of scary, you know, to just have too much money involved in the transaction. Um, and then also choosing a source of randomness, right? Because you can go, go for either DRAND or for KMS randomness, the lava lamps. Um, if you just set like the uh, the round ID to zero, then um, yeah, we also have a convenience function here where you just call request and you don't fill out the round ID. Under the hood, it's just setting the round ID to zero though. Um, how to migrate from Chainlink VRF. So that is uh, involves this contract up here, uh, which will make it convenient. And then migrating from Gelato. This is another set of contracts. Um, yes, and then I think I need to publish these contracts here. Um, let me think. I can put these in the chat. Or actually, I'm going to add these to the docs now. Um, and then all these contracts that we're using, like Conduit, VRF, Consumer Base, the Adapter Factory, um, the source code for the, the coordinator, um, everyone can take a look at. Um, cool. Thank you very much. So you can ask questions about um, all of this stuff in the Discord uh, technical questions tab and tag Conduit team and Drew will be able to answer um, for you. So, okay, thanks for joining us and have a good rest of your day. Ciao.